You're looking for meaning and purpose in your work. Hello? 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 We all are. Every year, Harvard Business School Executive Education helps executives like you reevaluate goals and develop both personally and professionally to turn their careers into their callings. Don't be different. Be changed. Go. Start by going to hbs.me slash go. That's hbs.me slash go. Welcome to Aquarian Radio at AquarianRadio.com. I'm your host, Jenna Care Lesson, and my co-host, Dr. Sasha Lesson, will be joining us a little bit later. Today, we have a very special show with Marty Rosenblatt on remote viewing and precognition. Marty teaches financial and sports precognitive application workshops via his Applied Precognition Program, which is called APP, with other guest experts from the remote viewing community, including Joe McMonagle, Dean Radin, Russell Targ, Skip Atwater, Stephen Schwartz, Ed May, and Paul Elder. Marty is an articulate and engaging radio guest. We're glad to have him here. As an accomplished physicist and natural intuitive, Marty's motivation is to perfect the formula for precognition APP promotes an annual conference immediately before the International Remote Viewing Association's IRVA conference. Let's see, there was a couple things I wanted to tell you. Um, he has his phys- an MS in physics from UCLA, which is my husband, Dr. Lesson's alma mater. Uh, individuals that are drawn to non-conventional applications such as remote viewing, dousing, and precognition are just the right people to assist our society in moving through the consciousness paradigm shift on non-localized consciousness. I believe that, that this next paradigm shift will be at least as significant as the transition from the pre copernicus world to the world we now know. Well, we know now, at least as significant as initially believing the world is flat, then, then to then approaching that a roundish world is a better model for reality. Consciousness is the fundamental principle of life. The personal conscious experience of the now moment is fundamental to each of our lives. All these moments from the moment of conception into the physical world until death tell the story of our physical life. All of these moments appear to be available in a type of universe of collective consciousness. So we will go into that and more on our show. And let me turn on the mic here for Marty. And give you one second. Okay, Marty, aloha. Are you there? Aloha. I'm here and um, a pleasure to be here with you. Uh, that was quite I'm an so excited to have you today. <laughs> well, I wanted to get some background to our listeners. Uh, I am a lifelong astral projector type of person, been doing it since the crib, and um, I'm very curious about this subject. And so I want you to go first and tell us a little bit about what you're doing and who you are and your organization and uh, do your spill for a while, but I will certainly interject with a lot of questions over the course of the next two hours. So take it away, Marty. (laughs) Sounds great. Um, Well, as you indicated, I am a scientist, and that is my my basic bent, is to try to appreciate and understand the uh, marvelous universe that we live in. And ever since I was a child, I was always interested in the kind of science fiction sort of things, imagining. Um, you know, what could be, um, you know, Isaac Asimov and Heinlein and all the science fiction writers. Oh, those two are my favorites. I actually met Asimov and Heinlein uh, several times at uh, Star Trek conventions back in the 70s. So it's interesting you mentioned those two. Yes, well, those are my, <laughs> among my favorites as well. And what they do is, 
you know, get the imagination going um, for more than what you're seeing in the straight physical world. And yet, I'm a scientist. And it was in, like, 1976 that I saw the first, what I'd have to say, real scientific detailed study that showed this thing which they called remote viewing, um, and also they had precognition in there. It was done by Hal Pudoff and Russ Tarr at the Stanford Research Institute. And mm -hmm. at, that point, at that point in time, I actually had some contacts um, just because of my work as a physicist with the Defense Intelligence Agency, and I went and met them. Um, oh, wow. Yeah, way back way back then when they were really just starting out. And the DIA, in fact, wanted to get sort of an independent assessment, and I was quite impressed, and their work was really impressive. The fact mm -hmm. that... The fact that consciousness can gather information over, I would say, almost infinite distances and infinite time, certainly um, um, very far in distance and the past and the future, is what they were showing. And that work was reproduced by, by the, uh, a people, a group of, called Pierre at Princeton University. And mm -hmm. as a scientist, I have to tell you, um, in watching the development of this, I got very frustrated because there were studies after studies that, using the scientific method, you would know that this is true. You would accept it. You try to integrate it into society. And that has not happened, is still not happening. Right. And and that is what our Applied Precognition Project is all about. We are really working to educate society and bringing this reality into um, our society where it's hopefully accepted. I mean, astral projection, what you talked about, that's very interesting because it's very similar uh -huh. to remote. Um, yeah, what's the difference between astral projection and remote viewing, just for our, our listeners, so they might understand the I difference? would say the big difference, frankly, is that in remote viewing, you stay within a specified protocol, and different people have somewhat different protocols, but you do it kind of on purpose, um, and you keep very good data. So mm -hmm. you generate generally a written transcript. Sometimes it's just an audio transcript. And then you stay with it until there's specific feedback. Um, and that's, in fact, what we're all about. Our whole organization um, is called APP. Our website is appliedprecog.com, if any mm -hmm. of your viewers or they could start looking at that. But AppliedPreCog.com, we do and apply remote viewing, as you indicated, for sports and financial predictions, and then we keep data, and we see how the viewers are doing. So it's very different than some, you know, actually most people have psychic experiences from time to time. Um, one of the differences here, in fact, one of the big differences here, is that you do it kind of in a purposeful fashion with some specific objective, and you keep records so you can truly know how well you're doing, and you can improve over time by keeping those records and kind of watching yourself. Well, the military uses remote viewing, correct? And then they, they assign... I, I'm not an expert by any means in, in the official remote viewing. I'm just an astral projector kind of gal. Mm -hmm. But they, don't they kind of assign uh, like a number or some kind of uh, uh, number? Yeah, what, some, some kind of uh, designator Correct. for a target. And then, uh, anyway, explain, can you explain to our listeners sure. how does the government do remote viewing? That would be good. 
Let me tell you a little bit about the protocol. And yes, it was used by the um, um, CIA, the military, special forces, almost all the governments, the you know the major governments in the world were using it. We got into it because of sort of spying back and forth with the Soviets um, and, and ourselves. And um, were the so, Soviets doing it first? Did they seem I, to discover it first? Uh, or? I don't know that for sure. I mean, things like mm-hmm. remote viewing have been going on forever. I mean, you've heard of the oracles of Delphi. It goes back to yes, the Greeks. Yes, uh-huh. And that was, a, a per, you know, they were making predictions about um, the future and what's going to happen, et cetera, et cetera. But um, I wouldn't know for sure who really started it. In some ways, they each may mm-hmm. have been worried that they were going to do it, and you know, I, so I don't know the answer to that. But the protocol. Yeah, we have the ancient era and the modern era. So yeah, the protocol was developed by somebody. We kind of. That's right. Made it a. What's a, called a, the remote scientific. What's called the remote viewing protocol, um, roughly, and there are different versions of this but roughly does start with what's called a coordinate, which is, a say, a six-digit number. It could be random letters. And that is like um, often all that the viewer will be given. Um, and there's a tasker who's associated with that, say, um, um, it just happens I happen to see a remote viewing session reviewed one that we wrote about with Ingo Swan, and he was just given mm-hmm. some cord. He was asked basically to go out to Jupiter um, at the same time that a probe was going to Jupiter. And so what the person does is takes that coordinate, and there's a tasker who knows what the detailed tasking is, but the remote viewer takes that coordinate, gets quiet, and basically his task is to describe and sketch what's associated with that coordinate that the tasker is interested in. Um, And it's remarkable. There are so many examples of these right-on answers, um, some for the military. There's another fellow called Joe McMonagle that has done Mm -hmm. just terrific work. in fact, and he's going to be with us in New Orleans for our conference in June. Um, but, but the point is that given really nothing but what is called a coordinate um, by the military, that's the word they use, you mm-hmm, then the develop a transcript. And uh, the matches are remarkable. Now, this talent is pretty widely spread, um, but at different angles, a little bit uh, uh, a little bit like the piano, right? I mean, uh-huh. everybody can learn to play the piano a little bit. Some people have some natural talent that comes easily. It comes early, like in your case, certain skills seem to uh-huh. come very early. Um, but a lot of people... In planet, um, it just happens yeah, so how does it how does it go find these people that have these talents? Or do they have like a talent search going on for remote viewers that they can bring into the organization? Any idea? Well, the military did just that. They put together groups of people based on incidents that were going on in the military. Um, and by the way, as far as we know, all of that stuff was classified during the Cold War. It was declassified in the early 90s by Clinton, um, Mm. but still a lot of it is still classified, and the government says they're no longer involved. Frankly, I hope they are. So they said that. (laughs) I I don't believe they're not involved. I'm sorry. They always do that. They say there's Uh, no UFOs. They're doing all this stuff. So, yeah. (laughs) Uh, if the government's I, uh, telling us they're probably lying. <laughs> um, I don't know, and if they are, it may very well be for good reasons. They took a lot of flack from a lot of members, even in Congress, about fooling around with 
this strange stuff, you know? I mean, this is rather unusual that you can gather this kind of information. But it's true. It's the way the universe works. And um, to deny it is silly. It's like denying that the the earth is, um, you know, round. You, you can't believe the earth is flat. Um, right. Well, if we are doing it, if our intelligence isn't doing it, then we're going to get way behind. So they probably well, just, you know, pacified Congress and they're doing what they need to do. Yeah, well, and that's at the level of the military. But I, I want you to know, I frankly am more interested um, in really getting our whole society to understand this and to begin to apply it. Um, mm hmm now, there have been experiments done um, that demonstrate that you can know, uh, let's say before you were to um, hear a very loud noise or even get an electric shock, that your body knows it a few seconds beforehand. It's the kind of thing that evolution, you can imagine evolution, would give those that have the ability to see a, at least a little bit in the future, if there's a lion around the corner, um, right. to know that it, it would help. And and the fact the universe permits this, and that's been proven over and over, um, why now don't we acknowledge that and, in fact, learn all of the other capabilities of consciousness? I actually believe we are just at the very beginning of connecting the capabilities of consciousness. And precognition is a really good example that I focus on because it sort of breaks the mold of linear time that we're used to. You know, cause happens now and there's an effect in the future, which is certainly true, but it also happens to be that the future can in a sense, send information back to the past, that they're entangled, they're connected together um, in a way that quantum mechanics discusses. Mm -hmm. Okay. Great. I, I, quantum entanglement. Yes, go ahead. I just said, you know, I, I said a lot, um, <laughs> and it's hard to all absorb. So I, why don't you ask me some specific questions? Well, I'm, I'm enjoying our dialogue. It, I find it very okay. interesting. Uh, so uh, let me get, there was a question I had on my tongue here. Um, oh, I, what I wanted to talk about was, so if we're going to bring this down into the average human's ability to do this, wouldn't people be zooming in to everybody else's bedrooms and things and then we would have no privacy? Um, well, what would that want to know... Be, uh, How's that world, yes. <laughs> oh, that's an interesting uh, question because remote viewing and kind of telepathy, I mean, even looking in the bedroom, some people are even less afraid of that, and the privacy issue is big, but what about the privacy issue of getting in another person's mind? A mm -hmm. lot of that is still um, certainly unknown, I have to tell you, in my opinion, I believe all of that is possible as we progress. Um, and that progress kind of has to come again at a societal level. Society has to get to the point where it may be okay for that to happen. Um, and that's a very, very big step. Um, and well, frankly, that's interesting. Yes, yeah. go ahead. But that's, that's how, a how long can they get to be okay with that? The first step. But, but yeah, let me let me say this because you know, okay. listening to what I just said is really scary. However, I believe it's mm -hmm. true. But the first <laughs> step is to conquer the issue of ethics where the people who have these capabilities will not, in fact, abuse them. And so there's a lot of 
kind of personal growth that has to go on as these capabilities get developed and that's what has to be encouraged as we as we teach it and get more and more people involved with it well it seems that we would have to have a society where it's um okay to be yourself so you wouldn't have to feel the necessity to hide so much of yourself but we have a blame shame um, you know, if, you, if you're caught doing something wrong or, or, or sinful or shameful, you're you're never going to be able to live it down. I mean, I mean they they follow celebrity, celebrities around and take all those pictures. <laughs> What's going to happen when they're in our homes and they can see everything or in our minds and know everything? Well, that is kind of a scary thought yeah. with this with this reality. But I can imagine an advanced society where. That wouldn't matter, but the society is a, you know, Michio Kako says we're not even a level, or we are a level three, or level zero civilization. We haven't even reached one. <laughs> so I'm, I'm curious how we would get to there from here Well, in your, oh, in your mind. I, I hadn't heard that sort of idea of these different levels, but that is, in fact, what I am thinking about is, Yes, these other levels exist, and getting there is going to be um, a challenge as all paradigm shifts. I call, you know what a paradigm shift is when you Oh, yes, start, I do, yes. So you're starting to look at the universe in a whole different way. Um, what we're talking about here is really basically a consciousness paradigm shift. And mm -hmm. the ethical changes are going to have to go along with it. Um, let me connect up with one which we're very much involved with now, and it personally um, was actually a bit difficult for me to get to where I am right now, and I, I'm, I'm going to say it very directly. We are applying uh -huh. remote viewing. We are applying remote viewing to make money. That and that that is like whoa. I mean, that's like predicting, you know, the stock market, and, and and you're making money. And if everybody could do it, wouldn't that just totally upset the money apple, apple cart, <laughs> so to speak? Where well, it would just destroy the economy, which is okay with me. I mean, something needs <laughs> to happen. But go ahead. <laughs> it's interesting. Um, that's not okay with me, but a lot of people <laughs> fear that. But also, mm -hmm. also, as soon as I say that, and even as I said it this time, you get funny feelings because people who do that and say it the way I did, which was in the worst possible way, um, um, are considered terrible. You know, they're those Wall Street guys <laughs> who caused this awful stock market crash in our last recession for the last eight, ten years, and they're terrible people, and they do all these illegal things. There is an association <laughs> with money and making money that is, is I don't know, just terrible. And yet... Oh, it, it is. It's like, it's like slavery, because those who don't have it are at the bottom of the cesspool. And, and those who have it are up there looking their noses down on us and, and just saying things like, oh, those people are lazy or stupid or this or that, and, or they're, they're lower level life forms. And, you know, so there's, there's this whole uh, cosmology around money, you know, well, and, and it's important. And I think it's over important. Yes. But see, and that's something that has to be gotten over. We have to get over that because it isn't money. And really what I'm trying to do, and this is actually the theme of our conference in June, is generating wealth and health. It's almost like healthy wealth. The word wealth uh -huh. actually has its roots in being um, um, healthy and shared within a community. It's very different than the image we just talked about. Uh, mm -hmm. And it's that which is really our theme. 
You know, I hope nobody quotes what I said earlier the way I said it, but <laughs> that's what you have to get through is realizing that it's okay to gather wealth, which, yes, it includes money, but it includes it in a healthy way. Um, Dean Radin, you may have heard he wrote the book A Conscious Universe, very well known. I haven't That's read it. it. Sounds good. Uh huh. Yeah. He is going to be up. giving a talk on precognition and health, where people were able to get a sense of what their health was going to be like and where their health was failing. Um, and the doctors, you know, went and tried to find out about that and they could not. Um, now, he, he, so he's going to give a whole talk on this, but my my point with that is that our human consciousness can be used for health in the very general sense that we think of it, our body health. Um, you know, it's very sensitive to what's going on inside in ways which are much more sensitive than we usually give ourselves credit for, and um, I believe that can be learned as well. And it can be used to gain physical wealth um, as well. And in fact, I think both of those go together ideally. Um, we are applying remote viewing in this fashion and in this direct way because the scientific method, much to my dismay, did not work. And if we're Ooh. going to get... If we're going to get society's attention, imagine if we can get average people who have this capability to one degree or another. Now, not as much as the superstars. Not everybody is going to get the Carnegie Hall. But you mm -hmm. can get good enough at this, and especially in a group environment where we combine people who have what we call an edge over chance, and that's being measured because we keep good records. Um, and indeed, we're now just at the beginning of putting together programs where we want to help people get money. And <laughs> this Hey, is help me. I could use it. <laughs> I got a mortgage. <laughs> yes. Well, that sounds good. If, if everybody had money, then that would change the meaning of money instead of the haves and have-nots. If we could get money to everybody, it would kind of level the playing field. I like it. I'm behind uh, you. Let's, so how do we do this? Well, first of all, and in a way this is a plug, but it's a plug in this context, if you go to mm -hmm. our website, Applied Precog dot com a p p l i e d p r e c o g dot com there is a link right there that'll tell you about the people who are coming to our conference in june it's uh june um twenty second to twenty fifth um and where, where is it i'm gonna put this new on the uh, in new orleans, in new orleans. wow we used to have it we've had it actually for several years in Las Vegas, and we used to actually do sports betting. But this time we're going to New Orleans, and we're going to do um, wagering in the foreign exchange markets because you can't do sports. <laughs> and um, we're going to actually show what we do, which is applying remote viewing in, in using one skill, Imagine this skill. Imagine if I told you that I am going to show you a picture tomorrow. And what I want you to do is describe and sketch that picture, that photograph, which will be a photograph of some place or thing on Earth. Um Period. That's all I told you. So that's the one uh -huh. skill that you need to use. 
it turns out you can almost think of this going back to your astral projection, <laughs> which was interesting. Mm-hmm. Can you yeah. astral project to yourself in the future when you see that feedback? And you see that's I what the remote viewing I think I've done that. Mm-hmm. Okay. I think I've done that. Mm-hmm. And, and you see, you can imagine doing it, which already says for those of us that sort of believe consciousness, if you can think it, it can happen. Um, mm-hmm. uh, you know you can do it. We know you can do it because I've seen hundreds and hundreds and people do it. You know, we've got thousands and thousands of sessions now behind us, and people can do it. Um, all you do is get quiet. I don't know if you do what in the remote viewing world is called a cool down, but it's sort of you get quiet, you meditate, you get rid of the day-to-day stuff that's going on, and Mm -hmm. uh, you then um, set your intention to send your consciousness, like move, that's the word that's actually used, move your consciousness to your feedback session in the future. And that's when this coordinate that we talked about, you would Mm -hmm. simply use that coordinate as a connection. So the tasker gave you a coordinate, and that coordinate is going to be associated with the picture you see tomorrow. That's the one skill that's used, and we can connect that with making a prediction in the foreign exchange market with the market moving up and down between the time when you make your prediction and when you see your feedback. Mm. And that's what we so, talk about. Yeah, go ahead. And that's what you talk about. Yeah, go ahead. That's what we talk go, about finish at, your the, um, right, at the conference. And, in fact, we will be doing six of those in three days. The first day is like an introduction for people who don't know much about this and want to be trained, and you can be, you learn how to do this. This is a natural talent. So you can mm-hmm. learn how to do this well enough um, in a day. And Joe McMonagle, who's one of the world's greatest remote viewers, will be teaching that course. And then the next three days, we'll be doing this um, six times, two times each day for the following three days. Plus, we'll be having six... Uh, um, webinar um, and workshop presentations. Um, Dean Radin is actually giving one. Um, Joe McMonaco, um, Joe uh, Gallenberger, and Ed May, who's a scientist that's worked in this field forever, back going back um, to the days when it was all classified. He, he wrote a lot of classified reports, etc. Mm-hmm. So um, fascinating. Yeah. I mean, If people are interested in learning this and doing it, um, boy, uh, we want that to happen. Um, And it's not really necessary. If they go to that website, you know, they don't want to go to New Orleans, but they want to find out more about this, go to our website, and there's a link there where you can join our discussion group. Um, And uh, we have, um, you know, short-term webinars, um, we can guide you into programs, and you can start doing this. And, see, it doesn't cost. It doesn't have to cost anything. Um, Right. And this opens up just the people you were talking about who are of goodwill but don't have wealth. Again, it's not money. It's, It's wealth. It's something that you're going to feel good about. And I believe that helps get it, um, uh, are just the ones who, in fact, can change society. Because if you're willing to develop your consciousness, I believe it automatically gets you more connected to your deep spiritual side. I mean, hey, that's where this connection with future is coming from. It's not coming from your ego intellectual side. It's coming from something deeper. And aren't those so can just people people that are oh, evil do this or does this align with you know, spirituality and goodness that 
you know, if well, it's like if you're life. doing this for some evil purpose, can you accomplish this, or do you have to? See, whatever I would make predictions for people, it never seemed to work for me. So I had some kind of block. But I could pick, you know, numbers for uh, sports. I had no interest in sports. Uh, But there was this fellow that kept asking me, and and, uh, week after week he would win. (laughs) But I one time tried for me, and and I blew it. So it was like, anyway, this was uh, 20-plus years ago when I was doing this. But there was something about I couldn't do it for my own greed, but I I was doing it when I was helping somebody else. Do you find that that kind of factor and effect with disability for people to make these? It's a major factor, and that's why I said it so grossly about the money as opposed to wealth. Yeah. You must get over this this mindset, inner mindset, which is put in us from really our youth. So many of us get in it that that greed, you know, which is bad in the worst sense of it, where I want more, I want more, I want more, without any consideration of using it in a positive way. Um, uh, And we have to find that balance. If we're going to get to the next level of consciousness, I guess level one, (laughs) um, uh, is one of the main things we as a civilization need to get over. And you know what? What? Was, what? <laughs> to to be good at this precognition, that's one of the things you have to get over when you're working um, this. It allows you to look just this sort of thing. Had you stayed with mm-hmm. this sports example, I think you would have eventually gotten over it, especially if you appreciated how important it is. In other words, to realize that... Um, hey, you were doing it for someone else, but as long as you thought it was for you, now you have this feeling, oh, my God, I'm getting greedy. No, you're not getting greedy. In fact, a lot of people <laughs> give percent of whatever they make, they give it away. That helps them get over this feeling of being greedy. Now, I'm not saying that well, you have that's, to do that. Well, that's precisely. No, I think, you, I think you've hit the nail on the head. I was raised Christian, right? Money's the root of all evil, and that whole thing about being greedy, and um, and I I never felt really worthy on some level. I had a lot of issues from my, you know, how I was raised. I'm not worthy. I'm not worthy of money. I'm not worthy of this. I'm not worthy. So those things were blocking me. But if I could have said, uh, okay, I'll use this money for you know charity. Right now, I'm involved in so many charities. Or you know, I. You know, I'm 61 years old now. It's like, boy, I could, I could, you know, make this happen and that happen. I know there's a lot of good, so I, I will definitely revisit this. You know, wait, somebody's yelling at me. Um, hold on, um, I'm gonna go to a commercial break. There's something going on. Hold, okay. on. hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on.
Hello. Hello, everybody. Welcome back. Sorry for the uh, interruption, but um, we had a little emergency here. But this is Janet Care Lesson, and I'm back. And let's see. Do we have our guest here? <laughs> yeah. Okay, Marty. Sorry. Okay, we're back. Uh, where were we when we were talking? I'm so sorry for the interruption. Let's pick up where we left off. We were, Do you remember where we yeah. were? Yep, we were talking about consciousness and wealth um, and how that really is a good thing and that many people, to get really good and capable at, you know, uh, let's say precognition, but almost any um, sort of advanced um, application of consciousness, and precognition is my focus, as you know, need to get mm-hmm. over, they're going to apply it to wealth, need to get over the feeling that they're being greedy. Um, mm-hmm. Let me say one other thing about that. When people work at a profession, they're earning money. They don't feel they're being greedy. If you are going to apply precognition and we are setting up professionals, there are people out there that earn money doing remote viewing. That's not being greedy. They're getting paid as a profession. And that's what I hope will happen to people who have this, um, who develop and want to develop this precognitive skill. It will become a profession. Um, And some people will pay you to apply it. Uh, I frankly think that you can apply it for your own benefit in many ways, and I hope many people will do that, professionally apply it for themselves. You know, imagine if... Well, isn't that like, uh, in a way, uh, what do do psychics do this? Is that what a psychic does? That's right. Many psychics, right. The psychics on the corner do that, and you know what? Some of them are legitimate. Some of them aren't. Um, One of the things to understand about this precognition and I think the way it's going to play out um, to get to this next level where it's accepted is it's going to grow kind of in a grassroots fashion, Uh, hopefully with programs like this, people getting educated about it a little bit, getting attracted to it, because if we get more and more people doing it, more and more people getting wealthier Notice the shift in the wealth and the way the wealth will be redistributed can, in fact, occur now from those who do not have the wealth if those are the ones that are attracted to this idea. Um, Mm -hmm. Because it doesn't take any money really to do it. You know, you just basically need to do things like we said before. You need to get over the feeling that what you're doing is somehow greedy. Um, A lot of people are right. How do you how do you recommend people do that? Well, how they taught it, and how do they how you recommend they get over it? Uh, I think by recognizing that in fact there is, it's not greed. It's applying a natural capability. When people do what are accepted professions and they earn money, that's not considered greedy. They're earning money. Mm -hmm. Um, You have to come to a place within yourself where you feel this is good. And some people do this by giving some non-trivial fraction to to charity. Um, Uh Others do it just by realizing, you know what, that was put on me when I'm a kid, and it doesn't make sense for me to be driven by that anymore. Um, right. I mean, just, just saying it is not enough. You know, you have to get down and, you know, you'll sort of see it come up, and you have to say, oh, there it is again, and work on it. Um, right. But it's very personal. <laughs> Yes, but, but it, and it's very personal. Um, but that's one of the beauties of this. It's getting into it 
um, I think they're called cities. In the Buddhist tradition, you do things to deepen yourself, um, a path mm-hmm. to enlightenment and all that. Uh, I'm not right. saying this is exactly that, but I think uh, uh, there is definitely some of that in here because what you find when you get quiet and you ask your inner self to go into the future and describe a photograph you're going to see, you're making contact now with this inner part of you, your deep psyche, and, um, um, you know, that's what's involved. And what will happen is as you go through this process over and over again, stuff will come up. Um, uh, just because you'll be thinking, gee, why did I get this one right and yet the other one I didn't? And you'd be surprised. Just in asking yourself questions like that, stuff will come up. And also being part of a community where people will say to you things like, well, maybe it's greed. Or maybe they'll say, um, well, <laughs> yeah, the, who knows? Yeah, uh, the, the- these cells, it's, they shame, they shame each other, and then you start shutting down, uh, and that's what I see going on. Well, if you're doing, if you're doing real spiritual work, you can't charge for it. Meanwhile, you know, priests and all those people, they make money. Religions make money, but if you're trying to do something that, that's spiritual, they go, well, you can't be doing spirituality and, you know, collecting money. <laughs> and that's what I see this, this shaming. Um, Aspect That's right. I go back some people you're will feel that. They will feel they're doing something wrong, and internally they'll feel it. And they might not even be conscious of it. They say, nah, I got over that years ago. But um, mm-hmm. that could be a block because they were taught. You know, there's some people who were taught that to do this kind of work, seeing in the future, is is not permitted. You know, I once had a person tell me there was a quote in the Bible that said you should not do this. Um, oh, uh, my mother would say for sure. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And yeah. so people maybe have heard that, and even though they say, nah, nah, stuff like that can be can, can be blocks. But also realize all of those things are what limit you, I believe, from getting to where you're, say, 90% accurate. Um, We're predicting the future in a way where a person has um, the tasker really sets up two pictures. One picture is associated with the market moving up, say the Eiffel Tower. The other picture is associated with the market moving down, um, say a picture of a nuclear fireball or something like that. You know, two mm-hmm. very, very different things. Your job is to choose, and the power might be associated with up, the fireball might be associated with down. These are randomly, all done randomly, so it doesn't, you know, it doesn't matter. But the tasker knows that. Now he asks you to describe a picture. And if you draw sort of a rectangular thing and you say it's a structure and you've got some lines in there and it's tall, and maybe you have some other stuff which isn't really right because most people are not on right all the time, but the mm-hmm. tasker can look at that and say, wow, now how would that person get a pretty good description of the Eiffel Tower? It's because he's seeing it tomorrow and describing it today, so I am going to wager in the up direction. Wow. What I, just, what I just told you is called associative remote viewing. It's the association of a picture with up and a different picture with down. But mm. the viewer just describes the picture they're going to see tomorrow. Yeah, that is a wow. Because it's actually that quite is, simple. That is. It is simple. You, but hmm Keep it simple is the philosophy and accepting the fact <laughs> that we can, in fact, describe. You, you know, it's so funny because understanding this is so far from simple to be incredible, and yet the skill is there, you know. I don't really understand how I walk, but, um, and we don't understand. 
but I walk. And we don't understand how you can make a connection with something you are going to see in the future. So notice we're not talking about getting into anybody else's mind. I mean, you talk about being ethical. There could be nothing more ethical than this because you're describing what you are going to be seeing in the future. Um, and so it you happens. can become very accurate at this. You can learn how to become extremely accurate. And then, how would you how would you take that into a practice where you would charge people? What if you're? I guess you could just guarantee it. Well, if I'm off, you get your money back, or something like that. Or oh, how, how well, can you imagine people doing that with business? The business aspect of it. Let me first answer the first question because it's clearly connected okay. to the second. Yes, you can get better and better at it. But over the long term, it looks like right now um, almost everybody gets into the 55 to 65% um, success rate for a 50-50 proposition. So you have an edge over chance of like 5 to 15%. For short runs, we have had people who have done 100%, but for reasons we don't understand, it seems to then go into a decline effect and then they stabilize again at about this, the good ones at 65 to 70%. Um, now, frankly, that is enough to get wealthy However, it requires a lot of discipline in terms of how you invest. Um, and that's the kind of stuff we talk about. And we have approaches which we think are really good for how to do this. And, in fact, some people have done it. On our w website, there's a guy who made $150,000 doing this. Um, wow. There are other studies. Hal Pudoff um, funded a school um, um, the beginning of the school doing it. I mean, there are all kinds of success stories, but as far as I know, we haven't gotten to the point yet where a person has done it um, to make himself wealthy over the long term. Um, mm -hmm. The $150 example is about as close as we get to, you know, enough money where, you know, it, hey, you start paying attention. Um um, but we do have a lot of examples. But what I hope to do is to get a lot of people who are making money in a slow, gradual way. This doesn't come mm -hmm. fast. It's not like you're going after a lottery because you're going to get misses at a 60%. Let's talk about a 60%, what we call a hit rate. That means you're going to make 10 investments. Four of them are going to be misses, six of them are going to be hits. Now, by the time you get 100, it's 40 versus 60. So I'm telling you the way it is, not the way people uh -huh. always kind of think about it. And that's part of the problem. We're trying, um, not trying, we are. I mean, we've got a discussion group now of about 200 people we have active people who are organized in groups because groups now give you the ability um, uh, of getting the 60% higher. And oh. um, that's the direction we're going is putting together groups. And we're also getting statistics on the people who are doing better, and it's those people who we hope to make professionals. So let's say we we find two or three people who are really exceptional at this. Well, maybe someone will come to us and say, we'd like to hire them. Um, on the other hand, they may just want to invest on their own. This is where right. we don't know how this is going to grow. It depends on what individual people are willing to do. But even at 55%, consistently, several people doing 55% over the long term will be making money. So if we get a huge part of the population 
being successful and they start making money, let's future pace. <laughs> and how do you see this changing society? Can you kind of tell us what effect yes, you, I, I, uh, you predict? Uh, why it uh, because I believe that the people who are going to do this are going to have to work through um, just automatically they're getting in touch with an inner part of themselves. And without doing anything special, they are going to tend to use the money in the way that we talk about as being healthy, wealthy, okay, in Mm -hmm. good ways. So that helps society. Now, um, there are going to be a lot of people who will scoff at this, and you know what? Fine. I don't think they have a sense of the spiritual. So I think this is going to shift the wealth to just the kind of people our society will benefit from. Mm -hmm. Um, That's my hope. Now, you asked me if evil people can do this, and Uh that's a tough question, but let me answer that because, see, I have a deep feeling this is definitely for good, and that's because I believe most people are good. But if you got a person who you and I would consider evil, most people might consider evil, the problem there is that in his universe, he probably doesn't see himself as being evil. I know. Everybody rationalizes and justifies their actions. Yeah. Well, <laughs> unfortunately, we have a lot of that going on today. You look at the um, suicide murderers. You know, uh-huh. they're doing it for what they think are good purposes. And so I cannot tell you this can only be used for good. What I can tell you okay. is, okay, so that's sort of the answer to that question. But what I can tell you is I have, and maybe it's just a, a faith, um, but it's also kind of a confidence that most of the people who will come and be attracted to this idea will be good people, and I do hope there is a transfer of wealth to those people, healthy wealth. Sounds like a good idea. (laughs) Okay, I have a couple questions that um, you said to me that they're good. Uh, How can anyone possibly know the future when it hasn't happened yet? Doesn't free will matter? Um, wonderful question. <laughs> uh, <laughs> not, and let's break that up in parts because uh, it gets okay. to the whole issue of precognition. So if you let me go here for a bit, because it's obviously yeah, go there. <laughs> the the not happening yet is the old way of looking at time. Scientists now are taking on the issue of time itself. Um, There's all kinds of people who are talking about needing extra dimensions, and time is only sort of the secondary dimension, that there's places where you're almost like outside of time and can be looking at all of time. Um, So the, the, the idea of it hasn't happened yet is what I would consider to be the old way of thinking, the old paradigm, where we're moving is recognizing, and again, this has been proven scientifically, that there are connections with the future. Um, uh, Even Einstein, interestingly enough, said the only reason for time is so that everything doesn't happen at once. That you get... (laughs) Yeah, it's wonderful. You get to savor right. and experience each moment. Now, let me connect this with free will. Okay. The only time you have free will, the only time you can do anything is in this now moment. This right. Very and that's what Rob Dan says. There's only the now. <laughs> isn't that true in a way the thing you know the most for sure is the now moment you have memories and we all know memories are not 100% accurate 
you know, whenever you mm-hmm. test your memory. Um, we love the example of um, an accident happens and you have ten people tell you about it and they tell you different things. Um, mm-hmm. Okay, but what you do know is what your now experience is. Okay, so let's start there. That is the ultimate reality. That's only where you have your free will. Now you get to make choices. You get to do things. Now certainly the sense of it being based on the past, um, how you've been trained and everything, we all recognize that's part of it. But nevertheless, it's in Mm -hmm. this moment you have free will. Now, what if, and in fact, this is the way I think the universe works, this conscious moment is not only connected to your past conscious moments, which everybody would accept, but in Mm -hmm. fact, is connected with your future conscious moments. And when you do precognitive, looking in the future, remote viewing, this associative remote viewing, that's just what you're doing. You're connecting the present conscious moment when you do your remote viewing session and everything with the future conscious moments when you do the feedback and get to look at the photo site. Now, we know that happens. Now, we don't know how it happens, but we know it happens. And just like memory is faulty, precognition seems to be faulty. And I think just like some people have better memories than others, some people have better memories of the future than others. That is the is there only? Is there only one future, or are there timelines and multiverses? Well, that's very controversial, and physicists have a multiple universe um, theory that is consistent with quantum mechanics. I don't personally believe that and don't think the universe works that way. Um, When I go and wake up, tomorrow morning, I have one set of experiences that is clearly connected with my life. Um, There are other hypothetical, and quantum mechanics does a lot with probabilities. There are a lot of probable things that could happen to me. Um, Mm -hmm. But when I experience my feedback session, there's only one feedback session that I am going to experience. Um, that's my opinion. So period. isn't that like timeline you've chosen so you really can't go back and kill your grandfather so you're not born because it would have already happened, <laughs> right? It's kind of that type that, of paradox, that, right? That's exactly right. And the issue, and, and I'm so glad you brought up that example, there's a distinction between what happens in the actual physical world versus the information, which is also part of the Mm -hmm. physical world, but pure information. Notice we are talking about information about what's going to happen in the future. And it's that information which is being transferred. I can't take my physical body, as the wonderful science fiction stories would have you think, and, and who knows, maybe it's possible I happen to think it is right. not. Time travel stories. And, yeah. But I believe it's this information that is fundamental. In fact, I will tell you, I believe that there's this concept, which, you, which is easy to understand. It's like a universe of collective consciousness, UCC. The universe of mm-hmm. collective consciousness is all of the conscious moments that all sentient beings experience past, present, and future. So, wow. Right. And, you know, there are clearly life forms out there someplace. We can argue how close, but we'll, I think we'll all agree the life forms out there someplace. They mm-hmm. are part of UCC. They are part of the universe of collective consciousness. 
And um, we have so many examples of remote viewers who have connected up with things. Go Swan connected up with Jupiter um, mm-hmm. in in the informational sense. Um, now, this universe of collective consciousness, which we're all, all connected to, obvious, obviously, as sentient beings, has this mysterious capability of being formed by all of our free will decisions made in each of our conscious moments. And it's the collection of all of that that creates this consciousness universe and that's why we can change it if we change our minds and change our focus and intention that's exactly right because we're all creating it we will Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so that's you know I've had a lot of these discussions and sometimes you can get your head around it and sometimes you just go what but when you have these moments of clarity it, it seems that you know, thoughts are deeds, and we are creating this reality. And if we don't like the program, we can change the channel. And so we're not, uh, we don't have to go down like World War Three or an apocalyptic reality that our religions are programming us into from the beginning and our culture by using these type of techniques. Is that, am I getting, is that accurate? What I, just said, I would like to think that we can avoid that sort of thing with these type of techniques, absolutely. And there's one other part of this which um, fits in right here, and that is some people have made predictions of doom for the future. They have not come true, okay? And these are remote viewers. And mm-hmm. it may be, it may be, that built into this universe of collective consciousness, past, present, and future, is an uncertainty factor. Just like in, it turns out in physics, there's this Heisenberg uncertainty principle. I think there's something mm-hmm. equivalent to that here, which is part of how it all fits together, and it's almost like you cannot be 100% perfect. Um, because... In a way, maybe that would, if you were 100% perfect, maybe that would get rid of free will. And so built into the system is the fact that you cannot be 100% perfect. And you make your choices in the now moment. It's affected by the past and, I believe, affected by the future. Um, And it's your past and future that are most important in in doing that effect. Right. But... collective consciousness that might involve with it, get involved with it as well. Well, when I, when I, uh, you know, hear about all these apocalyptic things in World War III, I just say, no, not to, I'm not choosing that timeline. I assemble it in terms of multiverses and timelines because of a story that I'm not going to tell here, but it's about an experience I had with extraterrestrials. But anyway, I use that and I don't go down that timeline and I just change the channel and it seems to never happen. Now, I, as a co-creator with God or as the individual traveling through time and space, uh, creating that, you know, it's like the chicken and the egg thing or, or like you addressed earlier. So am I creating this reality where World War Three and this uh, Armageddon never happened? Uh, Just putting it back. Yes, Is that what's happening yes, on yes some personal no. level? I, mean, I believe we this? are the ultimate creators of our own reality. And to take less than full responsibility of that, which is the logical position, <laughs> you know, it's hard to logically mm-hmm. accept that, but I do ultimately believe that. I believe this universe oh, we of do that. We consciousness think. is... Um, Ultimately, us. We are all connected. And so in a way which which intellectually you just can't explain, we are responsible for our own reality. Um, we always have the no, scapegoat in there. I didn't do that. It was that it was that it was God or it was you know, something outside right. of ourselves. The scapegoat oh, always, something went wrong. Yeah. Right. 
blame. We always want to blame. Um, always want to blame. Uh, <laughs> But, you know, you touched on extraterrestrials, and I you looked at your website enough to know that that's one of your um, um, key interests. And uh-huh, yes. I would like to tell you um, how I feel about that, because... Go for it. <laughs> uh, there's no question that extraterrestrials are out there, and, and scientists now more and more are saying as they're finding these planets. I mean, it was obvious before. The universe is such a big mm-hmm. place. I want us to think about where we are going to be. Look how we're talking about this consciousness and struggling and getting to the next level. I don't know how long it's going to take. Um, I'm hoping we're part of the process to have it happen in as smooth a way as possible and as quickly as possible. But um, but say it's a 1,000 years. Um, mm-hmm. I mean, if we're moving ahead. A thousand years in terms of technology is ridiculous. We're not even going to be able to imagine the technology a thousand years from now. And I think that's going to be true as well in the level of where our ability to manage consciousness at the deepest level will be. Well, you know what? There are other societies, extraterrestrials, um, that must already be there. We can't be the oldest living uh, beings, sentient beings in the universe. There must be others that are out there. So I truly believe that. Um, I do too. <laughs> yeah, for sure. And yeah. and looking and, at our most, own history, there are all these. You know, I, we're focused. My husband and I are focused on the ancient aliens, ancient astronauts information. And there's plenty of evidence that if it wasn't extraterrestrial, it certainly was some kind of uh, society that was way in advance of what we have even today. But looking at other, uh, or imagining or projecting what other societies that are extraterrestrial might look at actually provides us a some kind of models for us to um, get our heads around to co-create and that's why I enjoy science fiction as uh, you do. And that's why I met Heinlein and um, Asimov at the Star Trek conferences with Roddenberry. Because they, oh, they were in some way, they were in some way creating this future. I was back there when I was, I started when I was 12. So I was in the early 70s. I was in my late teens, early 20s. And they were in some some way projecting into this time that we have here now and they they created it in in a fashion by the steps that they took and the programs that they produced and the books that they wrote. Can you understand what I'm saying there? I mean I was there in that mass um <laughs> you know, massive experiment in creating a future reality which was almost like remote viewing because we were all there there were twenty thousand of us in New York City in 1975 for my 21st birthday that gathered around and we were celebrating that we were getting the movie and and all this stuff was happening now that was a lot of people and and we were envisioning the future Uh and how it could be now i don't think we quite got to that reality but we're and that's my whole uh what i've been researching is like how did they get hijacked by you know probably these government programs and other people with their agendas, right? But we are in a variation of that because we have, on some level, we have very advanced technology with our computers, but we we have obvious areas where the technology has been repressed, like our um, our travel system is 100-plus years old, right? Our planes are old, or, you know, so that, I think, is technology that's been purposefully uh, repressed, and we're not getting what's really out there, which is what we have at Roswell. Anyway, I'm digressing, but uh, <laughs> I was well, there let, in those, those conferences. Oh, how much of it, your conspiracy the conspiracy yes. idea and all that? I don't want to touch those. No, the Remember, we're all <laughs> responsible. So you, you know, we don't want to blame. Um, but mm-hmm. I do like the H, and I spent a little time reading um, Stitchin. Is that his name? Uh huh. Yes, Zechariah Sitchin. Yes, I studied. Yeah, 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 yeah. Zechariah, right. 
Um, and so he was very much involved in the early um, the examination of the same thing you're looking at. And I must admit I was uh-huh. quite fascinated by it because the hypothesis that they were involved um, at any level, but it's just that they were there and left um, means maybe they were just letting us evolve on our own, which is a pretty wise thing to do rather than interacting with us. Um, mm-hmm. I, you know, that's a, that's a hypothesis that I'm attracted to. But um, Well, there's one oh, part that says they didn't really leave. They went behind the scenes. Um, and that was the, you know, the ziggurats and, and putting on the mask in Egypt and, and developing the priesthood and, and the kingship. So, so they went behind the scenes because because they did honor free will and mm-hmm. they made a decision that this was um the the planet for the earthlings and they had to figure it out for themselves. So there's that's one part of the um the all the theory. But I was just tying this into the remote viewing and, and precognition by giving the example of all of us uh Star Trek people envisioning a future that had advanced technology beyond what we had back in the 60s and early 70s. And it seemed like a lot of the, and Heinlein was there and Asimov, and they had written about all these different inventions. And it it seems like a lot of the things have evolved and the other things are kind of retarded back, you know, left in, you know, fossil fuel technologies. So Mm -hmm. I don't want to go into that. But that, that gets into money, which is what we started, so let's right. just say we could envision all this money and create it um, and, so that well, we would take the, words, the planet past fossil fuels. I, really I think that's critical to going where we both want to go. We have to start looking mm-hmm. at this as wealth and this dollar bill that you hold. It's just a kind of potential energy. So the money is mm-hmm. potential energy to be used in the context of wealth. Mm-hmm. I'm sorry. Go Go, go ahead. Oh, no, no, I'm just saying, uh, I'm getting, so money is to create this wealth. So let's just imagine I had all this money. <laughs> um, I would create a system of transportation, uh, like a lot of people have said they've invented, but it's being repressed from being out there, where we wouldn't have to sit in boxes that are dangerous, that can be shot down or fall into the ocean or, or crash into each other, you know, or flip over, but we would be more in, in a um, a teleportation system. Not necessarily Star, like Star Trek, but more like um, Stargate, right? So there's stories that that technology is out there. Now, I'm not sure what's making it not happen, but maybe it needs some money behind it. So that would be one of the things I would do is get well, the planet off of something? fossil fuels, and that would be a paradigm shifter. That's what I'd do. At- I think that is a real right. That's a really good example of the what if, because if you, and by you I sort of mean us, the people who mm-hmm. think in a way of more benefiting society, you know, you have this image, and, and there's certainly a lot to it that the, the transportation system has been held back because, say, the oil barons or something like that. Um, for, mm-hmm. Okay. Well, guess what? If that equivalent for the next generation, if the equivalent of the wealth would go to people who are interested in um, some major kind of advance, an uh, anti-gravity machine, uh, you know, skip over mm-hmm. uh, solar energy and all that, if these were the kind of people that had the wealth, yes, that would happen faster. And that's my image as well. And so... Part of our trick here, um, or need, um, strategy, is to get more and more people to appreciate their own capabilities, to use it, and why not for wealth. Um, but as as they do that, that will also attract the attention of more and more scientists I mean, as more and more people start doing this, the word starts getting out, 
and um, it'll have other impacts even with people who don't want to to do it. But, I mean, science is going to want to understand that. And you want to know something? It isn't like science is a bad thing. Science will continue to go forward and um, further the understanding of this, including consciousness. I mean, there are lots of studies going on trying to understand how it is that we as human beings can can experience this thing we call consciousness. Um, they're trying to model it. Yeah. My feeling is the consciousness is like the most fundamental. And uh, as crazy as it sounds, it's almost like the physical world somehow comes from a world of pure information. Um, That's what I've heard, that you know it has to have the observer effect or it doesn't happen. <laughs> so well, that's some right. Way, it's that's all right. consciousness. Right. That's the right. particles don't move. And you so, know, uh, yeah. Yeah. Go you're ahead. You're into this quantum mechanics to a certain extent. That's great. That's great. But um, we have so much more to learn. Science, and I think science is, we need a balance. Going way, way back, there was a, a, a focus um, on kind of non-scientific approaches and stuff like that. Our society is very, very scientifically oriented. Everything has to be proven, um, uh, even though sometimes it's proven badly, but okay. Right. But uh-huh. if we can find a balance between the kind of spiritual consciousness kind of stuff we're talking about and the scientific world, Imagine where we'd be. That's a new paradigm. That's a new paradigm. I just wanted to mention before we, before I forget, that I heard about the level zero civilization at a prophets conference um, convention in New York City with Russell Targ, Michio Kaku, and Ram Das, <laughs> and um, I think they were on a panel or something when. Mitch Chicago was mentioning level zero civilization that we're at, and so that was when I first heard about it. But Russell Targ was there. Uh, it was um, it was a conference around you know spirituality and consciousness, but also entheogens, which is another whole field. But um, I guess what they were uh, intending was talking about just what we're talking about here: how you can see things beyond you know, your skin encapsulated self sense of beyond this narrow tunnel vision we have, realizing that we're more than our five senses reality and we have these capabilities like precognition and astral projection and remote viewing. And that goes back to Sitchin and the gods and what they said that they did was they um dummied us down genetically so that we couldn't do these things because the gods felt endangered because there's only about a thousand to two thousand of them and millions of human beings. So we have that potential genetically and so the theory is spiritually we can turn that DNA on and uh, take back our birthright which is these natural abilities for remote viewing and precognition and etc. And uh, we would have a different uh, reality if we're all all able to do that. Um, yes, and getting there <laughs> is not going to happen, uh, you know, probably it won't be all, because I do think this idea of the world being probabilistic with a certain amount of inevitable uncertainty um, and inevitable um, distribution of talents, uh, however, I think it's clear that the mean capability will move up, that we're going to be able Mm -hmm. to do precognition better and better, um, both individually and then I think this group approach is really quite exciting. You know, Russell Targ, who you now have met, um, I've done several uh, webinars and workshops with him. Um, Mm -hmm. So we know each other actually... uh, um, quite well, and he's one of the people 
who has been very supportive of this idea of associative remote viewing, actually applying it um, in a way which could generate wealth. Mm-hmm. Are you going to do any kind of uh, group experiments in imagining a more positive, kind, and loving future for all of humanity in any any time in the near um, future? I mean, that I could think I think would be something worth doing, huh? You know, that's um, that's very interesting. We have um, we have this thing called you probably heard of it, go to meeting. And we have had uh-huh, yeah. webinars with our members, so we're all on at the same time. And indeed, we've done meditations where we're imagining each of us and us as a group um, feeling better, doing better, being healthy. We've mm-hmm. never done that um, to all of humanity and that's an interesting thing to do. I, I may even want to do that in New Orleans. Um, that's interesting because oh, that is, thank you you. Know, when you get into this, that's another way of the wealth idea, giving back. Um, mm-hmm. I like that. Yeah, I like that. Well, thank you. <laughs> I just got that from our conversation. I, I I'm always, part of me is always in the future because I'm an Aquarian. I'm just future centric, you know, future centered. It's like, where can we go? I have to pull myself back to the now and, and say, okay, well, here's step one, two, three, four, five to get to that uh, future where it will work. I'm looking for the, the win for all. That's what I'm looking for. Where well, I, everybody I is at a much higher level. I understand, but the win for all. I want the same thing. However, I we may have to do it kind of a person at a time with the grassroots approach, you know, the growing circle. As you get a mm-hmm. little bit bigger, you're touching more and more people. And we're already seeing that happen. Um, but you need to bring them in, um, you know, one at a time because each individual person of their own free will has to feel drawn to this. Um Right, right. You can't can't force anyone. Oh, uh, and and what draws them to it? So that's you're putting something out into the morphogenic field, and in a um, outside five dimension reality sense, they are sensing you are and are drawn to you. I think the internet is somehow involved in this uh, evolution of consciousness as well, because you'll sit down there. And uh, you'll start looking for something, and, and it leads you. It kind of directs you. If you just keep clicking on the things that pop up, it, it can take you somehow to where you exactly you need to go. I've seen that happen over and over and over ago, and and it's like wow. And I talk about this on our shows. It's like we are somehow up leveling into some other kind of of connectedness to each other, and so this process while you're while you're even stating it and envisioning it, it being one person at a time, is actually growing exponentially. And I think it has to because we're reaching a, a point that if we don't do something, we'll be in the apocalyptic timeline. And I think that our free will on some level is making this change happen at the at the right level because if we don't, I mean, the predictions are, you know, the planet is going to be dead in 25 to 50 years. We're destroying our oceans. We're killing all these. So we're we're reaching this critical mass time where it's, you know, shit or get off the pot, so to speak, and mm-hmm. we're running out of time, so to speak. And so, I, you know, I don't think it's going to happen in the one person at a time. I think it's going to be exponential every day, and it'll be like the Berlin Wall, and all of a sudden you're going to wake up and go, holy, I didn't know that today was the day that whole major paradigm shift was going to happen. Remember the day the Berlin Wall came down, which was a, a major symbol of the of the. So I envision a, a modern Berlin Wall happening, um, and a lot of the people in the UFO field are calling it disclosure or something. Where all of a sudden one day we have one paradigm, the next day we're in this whole other reality, where at last people are being respected and they get their needs met. We're not in a needs meeting society right now or kind of like in a uh, society which looks down their noses and those people are 
poor, destitute, you know, they, they don't, they're not worthy in some level of having, you know, uh, as good a life as those that are rich. So that is going to shift. And this, this piece that you present here is critical. I mean, I get it. I may not be able to express it, but I, I really get what you're doing here. And I think it's awesome. And I didn't realize going into this show exactly where we're going to go, but this, this is mind boggling. And this could be put out there in mass in yeah, many well, ways. Like It'll blow your mind too. That's what we're trying to do. And, you know, your point about the Internet is so cool because, you know, because of the Internet and because of the radio, I don't know, you know, if your show goes on the Internet as well as over um, the radio now. Oh, uh, yeah, this Pop. is an Internet show. And um, yeah. right now, what I before I forget, uh, we have about another half hour, but I might, I, I think I might have to cut this short because I think there's a little something going on I need to pay attention to. But I want to invite you back. Uh, and we'll, we'll figure out the schedule. And I want to, uh, if you can, bring Russell Targ on because uh, that he, he's got a piece of this. Uh, this is 20 years later, you know, right? I saw him. Oh, was that 2000? This is 20. 25 years later? Wow. Anyway, it would be great to pull, go full circle with that because I think my husband knows him or has worked with him and maybe we can pull him into this. Revolution Radio, which I do on Sundays, gets uh, about a million uh, live listeners. That's what I've been told. So I want to invite you back uh, for uh, maybe in April. We'll do a Revolution Radio show. Uh, and then we'll reach a much broader audience because I think this is very critical what you're doing here. I want to uh, bring up. Come, you know, he's putting well, together a film now of um, mm-hmm. kind of all the people that were involved in remote viewing. So, in fact, he may mm-hmm. very what the timing is. He may want to come up to um, talk about the film as well. Um, right, we can do the promotion here because I reach a lot of people. Uh, are you familiar with Courtney Brown and his work? Yes, I know are Courtney. You? Uh-huh. And then um, Ed Dames. He used to live here in Maui. I never got to meet him. But um, Ed, Ed, how does your work tie in with everybody else's work? I, I guess that's what I want to say. The remote viewing, um, you see, Ed Dames is one of those people, I'm afraid, who has made many, many predictions mostly doom-oriented predictions. Um, Right. But um, many who have, most, none, in fact, as far as I know, the doom ones have come through. Uh, However, he um, uh, and the others you mentioned, what they have in common is their primary focus is just the remote viewing, where my primary focus is applying the remote viewing in this associative remote viewing fashion. And that's because we get to have statistics. We get to see, if you will, a precog fingerprint of all the people that come in, and they get to look at it, um, and they get to change it. Um, And they find it very exciting. The people that get involved in this actually really enjoy it um, because they're getting in touch and using a capability that, you know, largely remained untouched uh, in their own lives. Uh, but, yeah, I would love to come back on the show. That would be fun. And Well, um, I think that's what we'll do. I want to all – let's finish in your website again. I put it on my – my Aquarium Radio website is down because <laughs> it's being – I mean, you can still see it, but I can't add to it, but it's being uh, migrated. So I put everything on extraterrestrial contact dot com if you want to go listeners you want to go look at the page I made for this show and the link is on there you can pass it around and have your friends come listen to this show which will be in the archives and then I will upload it later on tonight uh, to YouTube so we'll be creating a YouTube of this show that you can grab the link and spread this around to everybody you know and the the conference is in what was the date of the conference again um, 22nd to the 25th of June. It's in New Orleans at the Hyatt Hotel, right in the French Quarter, 
uh, right where all the action is. Um, the website where you can get more information on that, and if you're, you know, if any of what we've said resonates with you and you want to participate with us, go to appliedprecog.com, a p p l i e d p r e c o g dot com, and there's a place there that you can make contact with us, and you know we'll get back to you email wise. Uh, and uh, we have a very active discussion group, and we have groups what you're doing this associative remote viewing. Um, if you have no you have, experience um, at all, you have webinars too, right? What, you said you right. have webinars. We do the or webinars, um, so you don't have to go to New Orleans. Obviously, one of the best ways to learn this would be to rub shoulders with people like Joe McMonagle and um, all of that. Uh, because, um, you know, you'll be rubbing shoulders with experienced people. But the first day is for um, people who have not had experience with remote viewing um, or associated remote viewing, and then that gets you into the next three days where these are where we're actually going to do six predictions. Um, wow. So, you know, if this speaks to you, um, hey, join us. But in any case, if any of this resonates with you, go to this appliedprecog.com and um, um, join us and, you know, no obligation, no cost. Uh, and we'll just have a jolly old time uh, creating a new future. Excellent. Well, thank you so much for coming on today's show. And uh, I will be contacting you to schedule another one. And uh that's it for today. Any final words? That's terrific. No, just thank you, Janet, and um, um, aloha. Aloha. Thank you. Here today, gone today? The pace of change can be confusing. Then again, it can be inspiring. Every year, Harvard Business School Executive Education helps executives like you build the self-confidence and decision-making skills it takes to thrive on change. Fight change with change. Go. Start by going to hbs.me slash go. That's hbs.me slash go.